welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class from HowStuffWorks.com. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. Uh, This episode is about a person who was on my list, and then our listener Rich suggested it recently, and that re-sparked my interest in the topic. Uh, Nell Donnelly Reed was a woman way ahead of her time in a number of ways. She was creative. She had the business acumen to turn that creativity into a very successful business before women even had the right to vote in the United States. Uh, And her story combines a number of things that make for a fascinating tale. It's almost like a movie manuscript. Uh, There's fashion. There's education. There's kidnapping. There's marital scandal. Nell lived a long life. She did a lot with her time, including focusing on workers' health and safety needs. But uh, she is, like any historical figure, complicated. She was born Ellen Howard Quinlan on March 6, 1889 in Parsons, Kansas. Her father, John Quinlan, had moved to the United States from County Cork, Ireland, and he worked on the railroad and also farmed I think the railroad he worked on might have actually been the Katie, which we talked about on the Crash at Crush episode. Mm -hmm. Nell was born at home on the farm, and John and his wife, Catherine Fitzgibbons, had 13 total children. Ellen was the 12th child and fifth daughter, and she was nicknamed Nell by her siblings at a really early age. Uh, Nell went to school at a convent. She didn't stay there, but uh, they had a school there that she attended during the day. And then she went to Parsons Business College, and she started working as a stenographer in Kansas City immediately after she graduated. And shortly after her move to the city, she met a man named Paul J. Donnelly, and the pair were soon married. And at this point, Nell was 17 and Paul was 23. But Nell did not follow the normal path for the time of a young woman to give up her career or education to settle down into the role of wife. Instead, she continued to work, and both she and her husband Paul saved their earnings so that Nell could go to college. When she attended classes at Lindenwood College in St. Charles, Missouri, she was the only married student. She graduated in 1909. Once she was done with school, Nell started to focus on sewing. This was something she had done for her whole life, and it was a skill that she had always excelled at naturally. She started making clothes both for herself and for her family when she was still a kid. A lot of the time, she also altered clothes that she had had passed down from her sisters. She would remake them for herself. Once she finished college, she went back to sewing, largely because she was pretty dismayed at the very frumpy options that were available for women who were working as homemakers. They are very sack-like from that time. They are very sack-like. She called them Mother Hubbard dresses. <laughs> uh, because at that point, she had left her stenographer job to go to school full-time. And when she finished school, she kind of did settle into a, a housewifey role even though she didn't quite know where her life was going to go. But she really, really did not enjoy the options for house dresses. She thought that she should look smart. And her design ideology was pretty simple and based on that. She just thought that women should have clothing options that looked smart and stylish, even if their work was taking care of house and home, and even if no one but family might see them. She was also really smart about cut. She created dresses that flattered the figure, but they also did not restrict movement. And when neighbors and friends saw Nell or her sisters wearing dresses that she had designed and made, they all wanted their own. And so in the seven years following her graduation from college, Nell kind of had a little bit of a cottage industry making custom dresses for women in the community. But she didn't really consider herself a dressmaker at this point. Her clients and her family, though, really urged her to take her business out to a larger market. So in 1916, she started getting a lot more serious about a career in dressmaking. After taking a look at the very limited market of clothing available to women in the Kansas City area, she had the confidence to bring some of her ideas to a department store. Yeah, I love that she went out and did kind of her own market research, and that's something that really was kind of an ingrained part of her work throughout her life. She always tried to continue to learn. And when she uh, spoke to the buyer at the George C. Peck Dry Goods Company, which was where she took her dresses uh, to, to show, she was worried that she might just be laughed out of the building, even though she knew there were not great options. She still was a little scared. But instead, she left with an order for 18 dozen dresses. So then she had a new problem, which was figuring out how to manufacture 216 garments 
really quickly. I think she had a two-month window, which uh, if you do any stitching, 216 dresses in two months is a lot. Uh, And Nell had agreed to this order without really having the means to fill it. So she basically had to start her own business lickety-split. So Nell and her husband Paul talked this over. Paul, who worked as a manager in the credit department at the Barton Shoe Company, had $1,270 in savings. And they used that money to get Nell's business up and running. She hired two seamstresses, bought two power sewing machines, and then set up shop in the attic of their home. That first batch of dresses had a pretty simple design. They were high-waisted dresses with a waistband yoke and kimono sleeves. They were accentuated by some narrow, ruffled details. Nell would say later that she just wanted to make women pretty while they did the dishes, and she must have really been onto something. They filled the order, but that led to another problem, which was a good problem to have, but still a problem. All 216 dresses sold out the day they were put on the sales floor. Yeah, there's a really interesting um, paper that I read in preparation for this written by two women, and they're kind of examining why these dresses sold out so quickly and why they were so popular because it wasn't as though they had no other options for dresses. Uh, It's an interesting read and we'll have it in the show notes. But basically, she kind of was onto this idea of like, you could look cute at home. Uh, (laughs) And people really liked that idea. And so at this point, Nell and Paul knew that they had to expand their business and they had to do it really, really rapidly. They were, of course, still operating in the red. Those 216 dresses had sold for a dollar each. That was uh, significantly higher than the average price point for a house dress, which I have seen listed as around 69 cents. Uh, But even so, people snatched them up. But even so, that's not uh, (laughs) anything like they were going to make back that initial $1,270 investment, but they both really saw that this business had potential. And so their next step was to find a dedicated factory space and move production out of their attic and get a little bit bigger. They found a spot in Kansas City, Missouri, on the corner of 29th Street and Brooklyn Avenue, but they outgrew that space really quickly. And in 1918, they moved into a larger space on 21st and Grand. Paul left soon after that to fight in World War I, and Nell kept things running while he was away. By the time he got back, Nell had grown the company significantly. She was up to 18 staff, they were operating in the black, and they were bringing in a quarter of a million dollars annually. So, understandably, Paul quit his credit manager job, and the two of them worked side-by-side, full-time, in the garment business. As they reorganized the company to keep pace with its growth, Nell became the secretary treasurer and Paul served as president. But Nell was really the one running things, while Paul took care of the business and administrative details. The Nellie Dawn clothing label, which was created by inverting uh, the name Donnelly, took off like wildfire. To keep pace with the fashion industry, Nell started making regular trips to Europe to see what was trending in Paris and Vienna. She also studied the U.S. market to make sure she kept pace with the other designers. She kept track of her customer base to make sure she was serving the needs of the people who actually purchased her clothes, and she selected the best possible fabrics and performed rigorous tests on them at the factory to make sure that her garments not only looked stylish, but would also last. Yeah, she really um, had a a keen sense of the balance between fashion and utility and how you needed both to really be successful in the market she was in. Nell was also really, really adamant that the dresses and aprons that they made at the Donnelly Garment Company were true ready-to-wear without the need for professional alteration. She would include little details that could be easily altered by someone at home, like adjustable straps and things like that, to make it fit perfect. But she also had samples made in every single size, and then she would put each of those garments through their paces, with models performing the sorts of activities that a woman might encounter in an average day. And this was all done to make sure that there was freedom of movement, and that no matter what size the woman and the clothing, they were always flattering. And a lot of the dress wearers in our audience will also love to hear that her signature handy-dandy apron line and her dresses had functional pockets. Nell insisted on this. I am happy to hear this because unlike Holly, I don't make all my own clothes (laughs) to have the features I personally want, so I'm always excited when I find things to buy that have pockets in them. I feel like a a fashion trader because I don't really care about pockets. 
I know I'm the only one. I just don't, uh, pockets don't do much for me. Um, Other than like a place to put my hand, unless they have a zipper closure, I don't trust them to hold things anyway. So then I'm like, ah, it just spoils the line sometimes. I just always, I always need a chapstick in there. Yeah, that goes in my wrist wallet. (laughs) Uh, See, I have a controversial pocket opinion. Don't attack me. Um, Throughout the growth of the Donnelly Company, Nell took a very, very progressive approach to how their employees were treated. Uh, As I said, she always studied the market and the industry, and in doing so, when she really looked at the history of manufacturing and where it was at that point in time so that she could learn as much as she could and maybe find ways that she could make her factory more efficient, she also became really keenly aware of the poor working conditions that a lot of laborers face. She did not want the kinds of accidents that often hurt or, frankly, very often killed workers in other factories to be part of her company's legacy working conditions at Donnelly were a lot safer than at most other garment factories. The wages were also better. Employees had access to medical care through their jobs. And because Nell knew how valuable her own education had been to her success, she offered night classes and tuition grants to her employees. And she started a scholarship program for her employees' children. Yeah, one of the things she did that was really unique, particularly for the time, is like she had a regular doctor come, like, I think once a week and just do checkups if people needed them, and eventually they could bring their kids for those checkups. The Donnellys also really felt like it was important that their employees felt respected and that they were recognized as vital to the success of the business. Now, some of this, too, is part of building up sort of the forward-facing identity of the company uh, because Nell was very, very comfortable giving interviews. And so part of this was also playing up how great they were to work for. And she once told a reporter, quote, the attitude of our employees toward the executives in the firm is not that they work under others, but that they are working with others. Nell's business, which started with less than $1,300 and two hired seamstresses, turned into a multi-million dollar company during the 1920s. By 1931, they had 1,000 employees. And because they made affordable, quality clothing, which was a necessity, instead of luxury goods, they managed to weather the 1929 financial crash and the Great Depression that followed it. This ability of non-luxury dry goods companies to survive times of financial instability also came up in our Levi Strauss episode that was not long ago this year. Yeah, but though the Donnellys managed to keep their business in good shape during those turbulent times, uh, their personal lives were a little less smooth. And we're going to talk about that right after we first pause for a sponsor break. So in early 1931, Nell got pregnant. And this was a problem for two reasons. One, her husband Paul had told her that if she ever got pregnant, he would kill himself. It is not entirely clear what his motivation for this statement was. It has been speculated by various historians uh, and people who have studied Nell's story that he likely suffered from depression, and he reportedly did have some issues with drinking and infidelity that drove a wedge between the couple. Uh, And two, to be clear, this child was not his. Uh, We are going to come back to the paternity of Nell's baby in just a moment. But to deal with this problem, Nell came up with a plan. So while she was still early enough in the pregnancy that she was not showing, she traveled allegedly to Europe. Some versions of this story say that instead she actually just went to Chicago. It's all because it's all kind of shrouded in a cloak and dagger move. We don't really know. She was not at home. That's that's the most important part. She was not in Kansas City. But she had told Paul that she wanted to adopt a child. So... She came home to Kansas City with a new baby, David, in the late fall of 1931. By this point, Nell was already famous. She was well-known in Kansas City as a very successful and very wealthy woman. She'd been profiled in magazines as a business leader and an innovator. Her company was a $3.5 million business at this point. And on the night of December 16th, 1931, that success made her the target of a kidnapping and ransom plot. So after work that night, Nell got into her car with her chauffeur, George Blair, and headed home for the evening. And as they approached the driveway of the Donnelly home, another car blocked their way. Three men got out of that second car. One jumped in the front seat and quickly tied up Blair, while the other two got in the back, one on either side of Nell. And Nell fought against them, but they pushed her to the floorboard and they held her there. 
Donnelly and Blair were taken to a house in Bonner Springs, Kansas, that was roughly 25 miles to the west of Donnelly's Kansas City home. Nell was kept on a cot, and Blair was kept bound and blindfolded. The kidnappers called the home of James E. Taylor, who was the Donnelly's lawyer that night, but Mrs. Taylor, who took the call, thought it was just a prank. The person on the other end of the line told her that she could find Nell Donnelly's abandoned car in Country Club Plaza. I always wonder when I read about this why she was like, oh, pranksters, (laughs) versus what a weird call. Maybe we should check it out. Uh, The kidnappers also sent a ransom note to Paul Donnelly, demanding $75,000, and he received that note the morning after the abduction. This missive is a little bit awkward in that it appears to have been dictated to Nell to write, but the voice changes from that of Nell writing directly to Paul to that of the kidnappers talking to Nell, and it reads as follows. Dear Paul, these men say they want $75,000. Use your own judgment. They kidnapped me and chauffeur Wednesday night. If you do not pay as directed, $75,000 in cash, $25,000 in $20 bills, $25,000 in tens, and $25,000 in fifties. If he, and at this point it seems like it's switched and they're referring to Paul, if he or any does not do as directed, we shall take him same as we have taken you, meaning no. If reported to police or any authorities, we shall blind you, meaning no, and kill, and then they use a racist slur for George Blair. Paul, yourself, shall drive the car, meaning our Lincoln, at all times. If this letter is given to any police authorities, it will be the last of me, and they will get you the same way they got me. Paul called James E. Taylor, and this is when the Taylors realized that the call they had gotten the night before was not a prank. Taylor called his law partner, James Reed. Just to be clear, there's James Reed, there's James Taylor, two different Jameses. Reed was the Donnelly's next-door neighbor, and he had a long and impressive career. He had been a county attorney, a counselor for the city, uh, the mayor of Kansas City, and had served three terms as a U.S. senator. Yeah, James A. Reed could be his own episode. He is not a person I think I would have enjoyed very much. Um, We'll talk a little bit about it here, but he definitely uh, had some, some outdated views. James Reed and Nell were very close. While Nell and Paul were, as we said, very successful at running a business together, their marriage had become strained and distant, and Nell and Reed had become involved romantically. Nell and Paul's adopted son David was, in fact, Reed's biological child. And so when Reed got word of this kidnapping, he immediately asked the judge of the trial that he was working on at the time if he could have leave. And once he was granted that leave, he immediately left the courthouse in such a speedy manner that it set off a flurry of gossip and speculation about what might be going on. The specific instructions to Paul in that original note had been that he was to park the car that was mentioned in the letter in front of the Mercer Hotel at 10 o'clock on December 17th. He was supposed to stay there for 15 minutes as a signal that he was willing to go along with the kidnappers' demands. If nobody appeared, he was supposed to repeat this the next day and then every day after that until someone communicated with him. He eventually received another note, this one signed by Nell, authorizing the withdrawal of the money. But though Paul Donnelly had done as instructed and had not contacted police himself, the police had heard the rumors that started the day Reed left the courthouse, and the newspapers had picked up some rumors and had been covering the story since then as well, even though they didn't have a whole lot to go on. It kind of seems like somebody uh, at the courthouse must have blabbed when James Reed talked to the judge about needing to to go. Uh, Someone involved in that discussion must have blabbed to the press because they were I mean, they they didn't magically conjure that she had been kidnapped. They were printing it based on somebody's information. Uh, And all of this, this rumor and gossip that was showing up in the press and with the police, which they knew could sour this whole situation, made James Reed uh, realize he had to make a statement to the Kansas City Star to address the situation. Reed's statement made it clear that if Nell was returned, the kidnappers could have that ransom that they had demanded. But if anything happened to her, he and Paul Donnelly would, quote, spend the rest of our lives running the culprits to earth and securing for them the extreme penalty of law. And soon, John Lazia, a well-known Kansas City gangster with a lot of influence in the city's politics, joined the search. Lazia had known Reed for some time, 
Uh, there are many versions of this story that say that Reed actually reached out to Lazia and said, you're going to do this for me. Uh, because after Lazia told the police that no one from the criminal underworld would kidnap Nell, knowing that James Reed was her lawyer, Lazia then sent carloads of his associates to look for Nell Donnelly. Like, 25 cars of men went out. Just feels like a movie about corrupt political figures. <laughs> for sure. And with good reason. <laughs> It was Lazia's men who eventually located Nell and her driver, and the details here are a little murky, too. But Nell told the police that a group of men forced their way into the house where she and Blair were being held. These men took their captors outside and then told her that they would take her home. She and George Blair were free and relatively unharmed after 34 hours in captivity. The whole retrieval of them went so smoothly that there were rumors that spread that this whole thing had just been a publicity stunt. Reed's reputation in all this was also damaged because his relationship with the city's criminal underworld became public knowledge through Lazia's involvement in all this. Yeah, it was a big, weird mess where people were like, wait, uh, this happened and you seem really interested in this woman's welfare even though you're just her lawyer and now you have a gangster finding her that did so because he's your friend? What's going on here? Um, again, it would make a great movie. Uh, while the kidnappers initially fled, and again, we don't really know how that played out, uh, they were captured. Paul Scheidt was the first man apprehended and brought to trial. James A. Reed served as special prosecutor in that trial. Scheidt claimed that he believed the kidnapping was arranged by a husband who he thought was in the oil business, uh, and that when he realized that he had been duped in this whole plan, that he had just let the captives go. In a surprise outcome, the jury completely believed him, and Scheidt was acquitted. Martin Depew and Walter Werner had very different outcomes in their court cases after those two were apprehended. Both were sentenced to life in prison. And then a third man, uh, Charles, I'm not sure how his last name is pronounced, Charles Mayle, or Mayle, perhaps, uh, received a 35-year sentence for his part in the kidnapping plot, although he insisted throughout the entire trial that he had absolutely nothing to do with it. The only evidence against him was that Nell identified him. We will talk about Nell's life after this kidnapping, but first we will take a quick sponsor break. <laughs> So, while Nell's return after her abduction, relatively safe and sound, might seem like a joyous end to the tumult in the Donnelly home, it was absolutely not. Uh, just a couple months later, Nell divorced Paul in early 1932. She bought out half of his business, and she became executive director of the company. And that same year, James A. Reed's wife died. And so, in December of 1933, Nell and James Reed were married in a ceremony that surprised their guests. They had invited friends to Nell's home for what the attendees thought was just a dinner party, only to find a wedding happening after the meal ended. Nell was 44 at the time, and Reed was 72. For the next several years, Nell Donnelly Reed's life was pretty smooth. She and James seemed happy, and her business continued to thrive. But the same could not be said for Paul Donnelly, sadly. He also remarried to a, wo a woman who was much younger than he was, named Virginia George. They married in February of 1933. But then just a year and a half later, he died by suicide. That was in September of 1934. He had spent most of his fortune by that point. In 1937, the International Ladies Garment Workers Union made efforts to get the workers at Donnelly Garment Manufacturing to unionize. But unlike uh, at many other companies in Kansas City, which had become a huge clothing manufacturing hub at this point, a lot of Nell's employees did not see the need for a union. They felt that their working conditions were safe and their benefits were excellent, far better than any other factory offered. A lot of the staff didn't feel like a union would be of much benefit to them, but this was definitely not a universally held opinion on the factory floor. There were uh, employees who talked to the union about things like tedium and exhaustion in their sections. These sections were small groups of employees who were set up to create garments with each woman working on one specific aspect of the garment and then turning out the garments as a team. So each person had one job, but they were still working together to create each dress. This handful of women who joined the union faced layoffs and pressure and harassment from within their jobs. 
The ILGWU, which had been successful in unionizing most of Kansas City's other factories, took out ads in the local paper saying that Nell and her company were unwilling to meet the union's standards and that that was what was really causing all of this um, refusal to become a part of the union. But between less than enthusiastic support for the union among a lot of employees and the few who actually did favor a union facing retribution for it, this whole idea just did not gain much traction. To combat the ILGWU, the Donnelly Factory formed its own union, which was the Donnelly Garment Workers Union in May of 1937, although that group was formed under the auspices of management to try to shut down the other union's efforts. It wasn't something that the employees decided on their own to form. The Donnelly Union president, who was Rose Todd, who was a supervisor at the company, started giving statements to the press that they could handle their own advocacy and they didn't need outsiders trying to manage it for them. This union issue dragged on and on. The ILGWU continued to try to force unionization under their umbrella on the Donnelly factory and also tried to dissuade department stores from carrying the Nelly Don brand, uh, they even wrote up little uh, notes that that the department stores could use to explain the situation. And this case eventually was played out in court. It went to federal court. Uh, a judge forbade the International Ladies Garment Workers Union from trying to get involved in the Donnelly plant any further. But then that decision was later overturned. The Donnelly factory and this outside union continued to lock horns for years. And as the issue continued to be a real thorn in her side, Nell started to tell people that there was no way an entrepreneur could start a business and be successful because of all these complications that unions brought about. This is, well, this is one of the reasons that the conditions at the factory were so, so good. She, like, she wanted things to be so good that people wouldn't want a union. <laughs> Yeah, she felt like, I feel like I'm doing everything right. Why are people still coming after me? Yeah, so then to compound all these matters, while her husband, James Reed, wasn't involved in the running of the factory, he did have a lot of political clout. He served in a legal capacity for his wife's company, and he was pretty openly racist and anti-Semitic, including when it came to these labor matters and labor organizers. Yes, so the ILGWU president, David Dubinsky, was a Russian-born Jew, and Reed referred to him as a foreign radical and far worse when Reed appeared in court proceedings to discuss the matter. Reed made the case that unions were dangerous to women. They were run by rapists and violent people. He talked about them being, you know, like the scum that was scraped from the devil's cauldron. Ultimately, though, the injunction against the ILGWU was lifted the Donnelly Company had created an atmosphere, like we said, of of both like fear that the um, these f- foreign devils were going to come and try to unionize them and the, make something dangerous, and also fear that anyone that actually embraced the union would get in trouble or lose their job, that they really did kind of make this bubble that f- prevented the union from ever penetrating. Yeah, it was like they were simultaneously doing things to discourage unionizing, and also really inspiring a lot, a lot of loyalty among their employees. It was complicated. Mm -hmm. World War II also brought a lot of changes to the Nelly Don brand as they continued to expand their lines to appeal to women who had jobs outside the home. So what had started as a business for making stylish dresses and aprons for homemakers had by the late 1940s expanded to offer business attire and accessories. The factory was turning out 1.5 million dresses a year, making it the largest facility of its kind in the world. And throughout all of this, journalists and consumers marveled at how they managed to keep quality high and prices reasonable. Yeah, they talked about a lot of details that... um would be associated with much, much higher-end garments. Like, they talked about the depth of the hems, which, if you know, you know, if you're looking at a dress from the inside and the hem is what is called deep, it means there is a lot of the outside fabric folded up under to create that hem. And in some places, they would cut those shorter so that you would save that couple inches of fabric, which seems like not much, but then over 1.5 million garments, it adds up to a lot of fabric, and it's like a cost-cutting measure. But uh, Nelly Don was not taking those shortcuts. And the company was also really unique in that it hired women for positions at all levels. Nell claimed that she hired blindly, paying no mind to whether the applicant was a man or a woman and focusing simply on whether they were the right fit and could do the job. In a 1931 magazine interview, Nell told a reporter, quote, I've heard some women say they would rather talk with men, have business dealings with men. I don't feel that way about it. 
I have no preference or prejudice in the matter. I like to talk business with a competent person, whether that person is a man or a woman. When she saw that somebody was a hard worker and could manage their job really well, she promoted them. And that way, a lot of women who started in low-level positions at the company rose up through the ranks to become executives. Nine out of ten employees at the Donnelly factory were women. And unlike in a lot of factories where, like, the line-level workers would be women and the executives would be men, these women were spread all through all levels of the company. In 1944, as the company was going through its growth into new markets, including all this business wear, Nell's husband, James Reed, died of pneumonia. She did not ever marry again. In 1952, she donated 731 acres of land to the Missouri Department of Conservation in honor of James, who she had spent many happy hours with, out in nature, hunting, fishing, and just enjoying each other's company. That was something they both really loved together. Uh, The James A. Reed Memorial Wildlife Area remains intact today. In 1956, Nell sold off her company shares and retired. She had been in the garment industry for 40 years, and the Donnelly Garment Company became Nellie Don, Inc., and it became a publicly traded company two years after Nell left. But without her ability to deal directly with textile manufacturers to get the best deals or to streamline production in ways that made the factory at its most efficient, the business really struggled. Nellie Don Inc. went into bankruptcy and closed permanently in 1978. But from her retirement onward, Nell Donnelly Reed remained very, very active in the Kansas City community. She continued to promote education, and she was a board member at Lindenwood College, where she was an alum, as well as at the Kansas City Art Institute. And she also became a member of the City Board of Education. Uh, She really, really tried to promote a lot of education reform. And she was on the Board of Trustees at the Midwest Research Institute. She died at home on September 8th, 1991. She was 102 years old. Yeah, she lived a really long life. Uh, In 2006, Nell's great-nephew, Terrence O'Malley, made a documentary about her and her business titled Nellie Dawn, A Stitch in Time. And then more than a decade later in 2017, uh, he started it several years before that, but I think 2017 was the first staged reading, he had developed her story into a musical. Like we said at the top, uh, Nell was complicated. Her life was not like all sunshine, rainbow perfection. But one of the things that really struck me in researching her story was her insistence that when the workday ended, it was over, Uh, something that grows more and more difficult as we all tend to check email late into the night and sometimes on vacation. Uh, And she also, you know, wanted people to continue to learn and grow. And so I wanted to finish with a quote of hers that I really liked. She gave it an interview where she said, You can't be a well-balanced person if you insist on devoting all your attention to business, even those details which can be managed by others, leaving no free time for your development as a human being. Hooray! That is Nell Donnelly Reed. Like we said, she's a little complicated. Do you also have some listener mail? I do have some listener mail. This is another one about our USO and Bob Hope episode. Uh, This is from our listener Thomasina who writes, Hi, Holly and Tracy. I live in Juneau, Alaska, and I was thrilled to hear my hometown of Cordova, Alaska, name-checked in your podcast about Bob Hope and the USO show. It reminded me of my family's story about my uncle encountering Bob Hope while he was visiting before that hair-raising flight that you mentioned. When Bob Hope came to visit the town of Cordova, which then had a population of less than 2,000 people, not including military folks stationed there at the time, to say it was a really big deal is a massive understatement. It was like a minor deity was in town. A massive entourage followed him down the main street, on which still stands the apartment building in which my father's family then lived, my father having not been born yet. When Bob Hope passed by the front stoop of the building, he encountered my uncle, who was a small child at the time. My dad's family is of Alaska Native and Caucasian heritage, but my uncle did not really lean toward the features of my Alutique Norwegian grandpa or my Klingit Danish grandma. I'm sorry if I said those words incorrectly. Instead, my father's oldest brother came out with a blend of both of his parents' attributes, resulting in auburn hair, a ski slope nose, and freckles. You can see where this is going. Bob Hope saw this little kid who looked a lot like him and stopped to chat with him, thinking it would make for a cute photo op. Sadly, none of us has a copy of this picture, if it survived, and said, Hey, son, how old are you? Four, said my uncle. And what's your name? My uncle's name was George Robert Jr., but he went by, you guessed it, Bob. And Bob Hope, after learning this, paused for a beat, and then he supposedly turned to his compatriots and quipped, Now that I think about it, I did come through here about four years ago. 
My uncle passed away back in the early 2000s, and that was one of my grandmother's favorite stories that she liked to share about him until she herself passed last year. Thank you for reminding me of it, and thanks for all the hours of crunching spreadsheets at work that your lovely show has made more bearable. Uh, That is the cutest family story, and it makes me laugh and laugh. So uh, thank you so much for sharing that, Thomasina. Uh, If you would like to write to us, you can uh, do so at HistoryPodcast at HowStuffWorks.com. We are also Missed in History across the spectrum of social media, and you can find us at Missed in History. History.com, where every episode of the show is archived and there are show notes for any of the episodes Tracy and I have worked on. Uh, and you can also subscribe to Stuff You Missed in History Class on Apple Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, or anywhere you get your podcasts. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit HowStuffWorks.com. 